How's everybody doing? Are we doing good? Yeah, y'all can sit. This is so awesome, y'all. Like, wow. I haven't got to go to college yet, so I feel like I'm kind of a part of a college right now. So this is super, super cool. But um, anyways, yeah, I'm here, and I'm, I'm a lot of y'all's age. I'm 19, about to be 20. Woo. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, Jesus got a hold of my heart, and whenever he grabs your heart, as you know, a passion lights up, and, and you just want to share that with the world. And so that's what I'm here to do. And, you know, to start this off, it's something my family does. It's kind of funny. You know, we have a group text, and it's called Swag Fam. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Any other Swag Fams in the house? No, all right, then we're weird. We're just as weird as we are on TV and maybe a little weirder. And so we had this group text called Swag Fam. And it's funny how in a group text, it's like everybody's personality in real life, but like extra, extra, extra. It's like you kind of know what to expect from everybody. So like, for instance, if I'm having a bad day and I send it to the Swag Fam and I'm like, what's up Swag Fam? Like, I'm just having a really hard day and like this happened and this happened. I kind of know that like from my sisters, they're gonna be like, OMG, Sadie, call me. And for my mom, she's gonna be like, oh babe, I'm so sorry. And for my brothers, probably gonna get nothing, honestly. <laughs> I mean, you know how it is. And then for my dad, it literally never fails. If I'm like going through something, it doesn't matter if I'm being so serious, he'll send a text, well, at least you're not that guy. And he'll send like a picture that's like so stupid. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm hurting here, do you not see my pain? And it's funny, so one day we were all sitting around the house and we're just like chilling and we're all trying to come up with the funniest situation of at least you're not that guy, such as, I think I have some pictures to describe a little bit what I'm talking about. (laughs) I think we have some pictures. You know what, if it doesn't work, it's okay because y'all get the idea. It's like, Basically, there's a picture that I was gonna show and it's this girl and she's like has a dog and the dog knocks over spaghetti everywhere, which is the story of my life because I had a dog for a total of three weeks and I've already given her away because it was just too rough, y'all. It was just too hard. But I gave her to a sweet family, so it's all good. But one day, so we were going through this pattern of like, at least you're not that guy trying to come up with the worst. Oh yeah, there it is. That's hilarious. Why are they wearing helmets? I don't know, I just thought that was funny. Like what? Like the egg probably wouldn't hurt that bad, but anyways. And I took the liberty of saying the one that was like not funny at all, you know, the last person that says a joke that everybody's just like silent. And I go, well, at least I'm not a plankton. What, like why did I, why did I say that? Like why? And it was like so awkward and like so quiet. And everybody was like, what do you mean? I was like, at least I'm not a, Plankton? (laughs) I don't know what I mean, but we're also so defensive in our family. I thought, you know what? This has to be something bad. This can't, this has to be. So I look it up and of course the first thing on Wikipedia is this little guy, the evil villain from SpongeBob with the little, uh, then it says the definition of a plankton. And it says it's a small microorganism unable to swim against the current of the ocean that provides food for big fish and large whales to eat. So I'm like, okay, that's terrible. Like, honestly, is there anything worse than a plankton? So I win. Thank you, all, everybody. I win. Good night. But something happened in my heart that night. It was weird. When I said that, it was almost like I heard God just speak to me. Hey, but what if you were? I was like, huh? What if I was a plankton? This is getting weird. You know, I'm thinking at just what y'all are thinking. This is the most random thing ever. But God was like, what if you were a plankton? Are they really the lowest of the low? Could you find passion and could you find purpose in something that seems so low, but something that I gave life to? Whew. I was like, okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna go figure that out. So I go back to the internet and this time I surpassed Wikipedia and look at what a plankton really is. And it was astonishing. You see these plankton, Wikipedia was right. They are unable to swim against the current of the sea. They float, they drift. In the Greek language, plankton means to wonder, a wanderer, okay? So they're floating around in the ocean, which kind of seems pointless until you understand where they're floating to and where God's taking them. You see, they start at the bottom of the ocean in the darkest part, surrounded by the most bizarre companions that all are trying to eat them for food source but they float past them and they make it to the very top of the ocean to receive light. 
for a process of photosynthesis. But then it doesn't stop there. The most breathtakingly beautiful part is once it receives the light, they don't stay in this safe haven place, but they go back down to the bottom of the ocean with all those things that wanna eat them and they provide 90% of the ocean's photosynthesis. And by doing that, they provide 50% of the oxygen that we are breathing right now. Come on, you know? This little plankton that I thought was the worst thing that you could possibly believe is actually providing life for all of us through the energy and through the light that they had to go and receive first. You know, that's crazy. When I read that, it was kind of like a fear of the Lord moment of like, wow, God, it's so crazy how you do that. How you put these amazing little things like messages in the tiniest of creatures. And a a mentor friend of mine said, you know, Sadie, what passion does is passion fuels you. It gives you the fuel to press past your fear in order to fulfill the purpose that God has called you to. So as I'm about to read what Passion City's foundation verse is in Isaiah 26, starting at verse eight, it says, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. For your name and your renown are the desires of our hearts. Then the next verse, verse nine, it says, my soul yearns for you in the night and in the morning my spirit longs for you. And as I read that, I thought about those plankton at the bottom of the ocean in darkness. They're swimming around, floating around, they can't help anything. But every single night when it's dark, just thinking, oh wow, I can't wait to get to the light. I can't wait for what I'm gonna receive today. And they're expectant of what they're going to receive because they know that when they go there, they're going to get what God has promised them, the light. Just like when I text my family, I know what I'm gonna get from each person. I'm expectant of it because they've showed me their character. God shows us our character and he stays in the same place. And sometimes we wander off and we get lost and we swim with the current and we become routine to the darkness and we just get blinded instead of stopping for a second looking up and saying, oh wow, that could be something cool. Stop the pattern, leave everybody else that is not following the light and receiving God's promises. You know, I feel like sometimes we're a generation that we sit here on Passion City College night and we praise God and we sing songs and we say, all your promises are yes and amen, God but sometimes we don't take the time to go look and see what those promises are. You see, there's over 7,000, 8,000 promises in the Bible. And I don't know that I could name that many, honestly, but I wanna seek because I wanna know. Because when I go back to the darkness, when I go back on college campus, when I go back into the world of bizarre people around me, I wanna be able to say, you know what? God promises that he's gonna protect me. God promises that he's gonna give me peace that surpasses all understanding. God promises me that he's gonna be my right hand man and he is going to save me and carry me whenever I go there first. You wanna know the promises when you go back, you know? There's a, um, there was a study on growingleaders.com. And I looked this up because what the plankton thing is, I thought it was really cool. It's the biggest migration that is happening in the world daily. The biggest migration is little things receiving light to give life to the world. Interesting. So if these little microorganisms can do it, I thought, why can't we? I think sometimes because we're fearful. So I looked up this study on growing leaders and I said, what is the number one fear that college kids have today? And I like this study because it went past the normal fears that you would think of, like the ones of like, I wonder who my roommate's gonna be. Is she gonna be super weird or super cool? Or like, I don't know how to do laundry. All these like kind of, I mean, I really sometimes like that stuff is really a fear, but this is a bigger fear. See, what it said was, they're not happy with the direction that the country is going and they are fearful to go into that. They are scared that they are going to sacrifice their beliefs because the odds are against them. And they want to possess values, but life has always been very convenient for them with little, need to sacrifice for what is right. Hmm. Interesting. When I read that, at first I was like, wow, that's awesome that that's such a, you know, big fear. But then I thought, 
that actually really bothers me because this is something that we so have an opportunity to change. We're scared to go into college because we're scared that we're gonna join the way the country is going. So really, what, what, like you're willing to give up your relationship with God that you've worked on for your whole life in order to save a reputation with people that you haven't even met yet, you know? We're willing to risk our whole relationship for a reputation. And that's what we're really scared of because we, we're scared of this sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice, it's a relationship. It's a walk of obedience. It's a walk of saying, God, I want to go in college and walk with you because you're the greatest thing that they have to offer, you know? And I fear that we walk into it thinking it's a sacrifice. And do you know what people think? Other college kids, when they look at us and they think, they see us feeling as though this is a sacrifice and a burden on us, they're like, well, why would I wanna be with them? But when we walk into there and we're celebrating and we're like, yes, all your promises are yes and amen. They're like, wait, what's that? Yes, all your promises. And then it becomes the biggest migration ever because it's exciting. There's a parable in Matthew. It's about the 10 bridesmaids or the 10 virgins. And when I was reading this, honestly, I didn't really understand it the first time I read it. So I read it again didn't understand it, read it again. I didn't understand it again. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to ask somebody. And I asked a mentor. She said, well, Sadie, you wouldn't understand the significance of this unless you read up on ancient Jewish culture of engagement processes back then, because that's the coolest part about it. So I'm like, do tell, check this out. So in ancient Jewish history, the engagement process was a lot different than it is today. Because what would happen is the bride and the bridegroom, when they got engaged, they didn't set a, wet for, uh, a date for their wedding. So they didn't know when it was gonna be. But y'all may be thinking, what, that is crazy. Because you have to prepare. Well, they did prepare, but they weren't going to get married until they were fully prepared. You see, what happened was the bride went her own separate way and she prepared in a way of like, getting like she bathed every day, she put her perfume on every day. She, got, she had to get completely ready every single day as if that was the day of her wedding because she didn't know when the bridegroom was going to return. So the bridegroom, what he would do is he would go off and he would prepare the home for the family, for his future wife and for his future family and he would get ready in that way. Well, what the bridesmaids would do is every day they would have to go get the oil to light the lamps because they were in charge of when the bridegroom would return, they would light the way to the celebration and get the whole town excited. And they would say, the bridegroom is here, the bridegroom is here, it's time, it's time, we're going to celebrate. So it was like an exciting time and they had to be prepared to lead the way to a celebration. So in this parable, it picks up. And what happens is the bridegroom makes his return. The bridesmaids, there were 10 of them. Five of them did not have the oil prepared. The other five did. Now these lamps weren't just like little lamps back in the day. They were big torches that really lighted up the way. So they had to get jars of oil. So you really, really had to be prepared for this. And they had to be expectant of his return. So there was a day he came back and the five of them were ready and the other five weren't. And they were like, oh no, give me your oil, please, because we don't have it and we can't light the way. And the other five were like, we can't, sorry, like we only have enough for us. And they were like, ah, so they ran. And the other five lit the way and they say, the bridegroom is here, the bridegroom is here. And they all went in to celebrate and they all had a great time. Well, at the same time, the other five come running and they're knocking on the door. They say, let us in, let us in, we're here. We have the light. And it picks up with the Lord saying, you can't come in. Surely you you weren't ready for my return. You didn't know when the day was coming. They weren't ready because they weren't expectant. So they didn't get to celebrate. And they, their effect on the whole town was it didn't really light the whole way. It wasn't in complete celebration. So do y'all see that if half of us Christians go in and we're like, yes, and the other half don't, it honestly sets this tone to the world with, wait, what are they trying to do? But if we all go in together with the biggest migration of the world after first receiving the light and getting our spiritual preparation ready, then imagine the change we can make. It would be huge, it would be huge. David, Louis Giglia talks about David all the time. 
So I'm not even going to try to touch it because he is awesome. But I am going to read y'all this verse because I think that this is really cool. This is a cry out from David to God. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 22, starting at verse 17. And it says, he reached down from on high and he took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from my foes, from those who were too strong for me. They comforted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Wow. You know, David, what I love about this is David wasn't crying out to God from just a place of save me. He was crying out to to God from a place of deliverance, of a relationship that he had already obtained with God way before this moment. You see, before David was saved in this moment, before he was saved from Saul, before he was saved from the enemies, before he was even saved from the giant, he was delivered from the lions and the bears as just a shepherd boy. And David actually kind of started out as anyone but that guy. He was the not that guy. Because when Samuel the prophet showed up in this town, and he was like, hey, Jesse, let me see your kids to see if any of these people can be king. As y'all know, Jesse went through the list, but he didn't say David. No way, not David. He said, Jesse said, this, the prophet Samuel said, so there's no one else, no one else. He said, oh, no, oh, no, not David. Oh, oh, yes, there is one more, sorry. Um, out in, but he's a shepherd boy, he couldn't, do, he couldn't do that. Not knowing that David was out there maintaining and preparing and really in this place of prospering a relationship with God that was going to last him throughout all these other things that God was able to deliver him from because David knew the character of God when he cried out. Do you see, when you read this in 2 Samuel, he calls God all these names and they're so intentional. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my savior from the violent people who saved me. He will reach down and grab me from deep waters. He drew me out because my God takes delight in me and I've seen it for all these years. So he believed because he was coming from a place that he had seen. So guys, if we want to walk in to a college campus and we want to deliver his promises and we wanna light it up, then we have to go and we have to receive and we have to get our spiritual preparation ready and rooted. You know, Emily over here, she gave me a book. It's called Anonymous. It was so good. And it was about the hidden years, the times where Jesus was in the desert. The times where Jesus stepped back and took a moment to just pray with God, his father. And it was really cool because there was this part in the book where it said, in Jesus' hidden years, whenever he was out, whenever he was in places that were painfully, people were painfully watching him, like so many people, he was so popular, he was able to maintain a spirit of hiddenness that he had obtained from that one-on-one relationship he had with God. And I'm gonna tell y'all something y'all may not wanna hear. That moment of reaching out for light, that moment of hearing what God, it doesn't just happen here on Wednesday night. No, 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 that's not it. It's going from here to your room where nobody can see you. It's going from here to your car rides when you have the opportunity to turn on the radio and just stop or just stop for a second and talk to our Father. It's gonna come from those moments where you get to choose, am I gonna go out there and I'm gonna go to this party because it would really be good for my reputation and for like my sorority sisters, or am I gonna go and I'm gonna pray because tonight I need to be with my father because I am hurting and I am too weak to go into that place and I am not ready for that. You have to know your limit. We have to push ourselves in that. And friends, we have to be accountable to each other. Y'all are sitting here tonight. I I just ask that before y'all leave or in the car ride home that y'all talk about that and say, hey, listen, you, I need you to keep me accountable this year and do not let them waver. Not just accountable in the spotlight, but accountable in the private moments. Accountable when y'all are in the dorm, accountable when y'all are in the car, in every place, because that's what it's gonna take for us to get to this place. You know, I was, 
listening to Priscilla Shire. I don't know if y'all know her. She's an amazing speaker. Yes, shout out to my girl. And she said this really cool thing, and I was listening to it in the car right here. She said, all of God's promises, it's like God isn't just gonna put them in our way and we're just gonna like, you know, like all of a sudden just have them, but he's gonna put them in our reach so that we can reach out and grab them. So we're on our way here. And I had this whole message prepared and everything was cruising and you know, you're just like, man, this is just a great day. Thank you, Jesus. And then he speaks the word to you and you're like, wait, did you just say that to me? Cause I'm really confused now. And he spoke a word to me, that threw me off. I was three minutes from being here, three minutes. I was so close, almost made it. And we were driving in all this traffic, which y'all have a lot of traffic. This is not like that in Louisiana, wow. And so we drive past this homeless man and our eyes locked. And I just felt something in my heart that God said to me, he said, that man, I died to take his pain away. He said, go out and put it in his reach. And then you're gonna see how I feel. I was like, okay, are you sure? Can somebody else do it? I literally prayed that somebody else would do it as I'm watching this happen. And I watched this man walk by. Here's the homeless man, he walks by. He looks and he keeps walking. And then all of a sudden I see him go, and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then he walked away. I was like, oh no, now I'm really gonna have to do it. So we keep driving and I tell my friend that's driving, I said, look, I'm sorry, this is not gonna make sense. I know we're already running late, but you gotta turn around. You gotta turn around. And I grab my Jesus Bible and I walk up to this man. I said, hi, I'm Sadie. I said, I don't have any money, honestly. I don't have anything on me right now, but I do have this, and this is everything, and I wanna give this to you. And he looked at me, and his eyes filled with tears. He said, no, I can't take that. I said, well, sure you can, sure you can. Like, please take it, please. Like, I really wanna give this to you. He said, no. He said, I'm an atheist. I said, Okay, well, just, just take it, please, like, please take it. He said, he said, no, I'm not gonna take that, I can't. So I said, okay, I'll respect that. So I start walking away and I turn around and I look at him and I said, are you sure? He said, yes. So I lay the book down. He goes, no, 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 don't leave it, don't leave it. I was like, do you want it? He's like, no, I don't want it, but don't leave it. I said, okay, why? He said, please give it to somebody that will take it. Cause somebody needs it, but it just can't be me. And my heart broke. And Jesus said, that is how I feel. Because Jesus is extending his hand to us with truth, with promises, with something that can save us from a dark world. And sometimes we just say no. No, we don't want that. We're just gonna lay here. We're just gonna stick with this life. We just walk away. And Jesus is saying, no, are you sure? Please take it. I died for this, please take it. And some of us just say, no, we don't want that, Jesus. He said, are you sure? He tries, he begs, but it does take us pursuing him. It does. There has to be a moment that we have to pursue him. And that guy knew somebody would. He knew. He didn't feel worthy and that breaks my heart because we're all worthy. But he knew that something in that book was good because he didn't want me to lay it on the floor. He didn't want me to give up on it. He saw it in my eyes that what I was holding was truth and something I believed in. And so I challenge you, when you walk onto that campus, you beg people to take the truth. But when you beg, you better know the truth because they're watching you and they're saying, do you believe it enough to take it on to the next person? Do you believe it enough to act it out? Do you believe it enough to give your life for it to know how Jesus felt? That's heavy. And y'all, I don't cry that much, but I cried about the whole way here. 
When I saw Emily, I was just weeping. I was like, I just can't do this. Like I'm overwhelmed because his love is overwhelming. What he did for us is overwhelming. There's a really cool thing about plankton as I was reading. If you're ever at at a tropical beach or something, sometimes you may have seen this actually, in the sand, when you're walking in the sand, if you step, something glows. This happened to me once. I was walking in the sand with my cousins and I started stepping and something was glowing. I was like, oh, oh, whoa, glitter, what is that? So it's like, kept stepping, I was like, it's glowing, this is crazy, this is so cool. Well, when I was reading about the plankton, this is years later, it was like, hey, that thing that you're stepping on, that was a plankton. But what's interesting is that you had to step on it for it to glow. You had to step on it for it to glow. I'm gonna tell you all a personal story about my life from a place of brokenness. You know, I have a tattoo that says fearless. If y'all are against tattoos, I'm really sorry. It's a big part of my life. I'm gonna share it with y'all. So I realized for a moment in time, I thought I was fearless. I thought, wow, I am fearless. I am free of this. This is awesome. But one day it hit me. It wasn't that I was fearless, but I was just running from the place where fear was. Because I was actually afraid of that. And I was like, oh no, God, I'm fearless, yeah. And he's like, all right, put a tornado right in front of you. Now are you scared? Oh my God, I'll get in the bathtub, like a freak out, you know? Like I wasn't fearless, I was running from fear. And more specifically, there was this place of brokenness in my heart. And after it happened, it was actually a breakup and a lot of you saw it on YouTube, which is kind of weird because you don't want to talk about breakups on YouTube, it's awkward, but it, a lot of good came from it. I didn't wanna do that because I was in a place of brokenness. And for a long time, I was mad, man, I was hurting. I was afraid, I was broken, and I was just like, oh, this is, I don't wanna talk about it, I don't wanna deal with it, I don't even wanna cry about it, so if I talk about it, I know I cry about it, so I'm not even just gonna talk about it, I'm just gonna run from it. So I just ran. I just kept, just like all the other fish, I was just running on my own current and I was just swimming around in the darkness and I was okay with that because everybody else was with me and it was fine and they thought I was fearless, so we're all good, right? No. What I thought was that time would heal it. I thought, no, it's okay, time is gonna heal this. But no, guys, time does not heal. Jesus heals. What time does, it time fogs things a little bit. It makes you forget about it from time to time. But whenever somebody's name comes up or whenever something's right in front of you, if you feel a drop in your stomach and you don't feel peace and you feel fear, then time did not heal, you know? And for me, I called my mentor and I said, I don't think I really am healed from this. And I think I'm really so afraid. And she said, Sadie, the good thing is you can be, but the bad thing is you're gonna have to go there. Oh, but I don't wanna go there. Well, she said, well, you're gonna have to. If you want God to cover it with truth, then you have to speak out the lies. If you want to experience God's beauty, you have to exhale your ugly. Oh, but I don't want to, but you have to. So I got down on my knees, heavy, brokenhearted. And I went back to the moments and the words that were spoken to me. In the times that I felt afraid and I had to go there, the times that the world stepped on me and I had to remind myself of it. In every single situation, every time the world stepped on me, something in me began to glow because Jesus was covering it and he was redeeming it and he was restoring it because he promised me he would. I just didn't promise him that I would. And finally, when I promised him I would, he took it from me just as he had promised to. And we became in an intimate relationship that cannot be broken. And yes, now I am fearless and I have walked away from that. But. And I want you to understand that because when the plankton are up at the top, receiving light in the safe haven, when they go back to the ocean in the darkness, don't think for a second that they're afraid. 
Don't think that they're going back into a darkness of pain. No, what photosynthesis, that process does is it fuels the activity. They are being fueled with passion to walk back, not to a life of pain, but walk back to a life of purpose to bring light to the world, to light it up. So guys, what God is gonna do in your heart tonight, what Holy Spirit has the ability to do is to instantly heal you and cover you completely and fill you completely with light, but you have to go there to get it. You have to go there and ask him to receive it. And what's gonna happen is anytime you talk about those broken parts, those bad parts, those scary times, you're not gonna be talking about it from a place of pain, but you're gonna be talking about it from a place of purpose rooted in the passion that God is going to install in you to change the world and make a difference in a life around you. He has the ability to do that through you because his word that he puts in your mouth is just as powerful as his word always is. It's amazing that he entrusts us with that.